appreciate very much for beautiful music presentation. When I was asked to uh, come to speak to you, and I requested to sing that beautiful song because that is the most beautiful, praising song for the Savior. And there are many beautiful songs about the Jesus Christ, but I particularly feel that beauties of this great song. My brothers and sisters, it's a humbling experience for me to uh, stand before you in this capacity. To me, this is a second language that I'm speaking to you. I sincerely hope and pray that a spirit of the Lord be with us today tonight so that we can communicate with the Spirit. As I listen to this beautiful song, I remember that what a great pain and agony, the ordeal of this great holy man the Savior Jesus Christ. After Last Supper, he took eleven apostles to the beneath of Mount Olive. After eleven apostles was guided by the Savior, and they were heading to the Mount Olive. And then out of eleven, Jesus took three apostles Peter and James and John, and he took them to the midst of the grove of Garden of Gethsemane. As he was departing, and he expressed his great concern to these three apostles, and he said something like this, My soul, is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. And he left these three brethren. That was a time even the Savior of the world, he needed and needed the divine fellowship by his friend, Peter and James and John. And he went to the midst of the grove and he prayed fervently and on earnestly, O oh God, let this cap pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And he prays so hard for you and me. And when he came back, apostle was sleeping, as you know. They didn't know what was a great the occasion that Jesus has, has to go through. And then that was a time the divine fellowship was needed by the Savior Jesus Christ. And he went back again and he prayed, O oh God, if this not can pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. It was a time, pain, an ordeal, suffering, and then modern scriptures. Jesus himself recorded through the prophet Joseph, Doctrine Covenant section, 19 section, the verse 15 in the right in the middle part, 
Jesus expressed himself how sore you know not. How exquisite you know not. Yea, O heart bare, you know not. That was the expression of our Savior. And then Jesus said, Yea, for behold, I, God, suffer these things for all, that they might not have suffered if they would repent. An 18th verse, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, both body and spirit, to breathe at every pore of my body, that I might not drink better cup and shrink. And glory to the Father. And nevertheless, I partook and I finished my preparation of the children of man. What a pain. What a suffering. The mankind cannot comprehend the pain and the suffering. For you and me, my brothers and sisters. And Jesus went on the cross and died for you and me. This is the center of our great gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jesus of Nazareth is the only name like a Paul expressed. There is no name under the heaven whereby we might be saved. Jesus Christ. Jesus, the beautiful name Jesus, which means Jehovah is salvation, is the only name whereby we might be saved. My brothers and sisters, how much we know about him. I stand before you this night and humbly, and I bear you my solemn witness that Jesus Christ is our Savior of the world. And I bear you my solemn witness that same Jesus appeared to the boy Joseph. And even after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to this American continent to visit the third Nephi, the Nephites, the prophet disciple Nephi recorded the following. The 11th chapter, the verse 14, the third Nephi, Jesus himself testified that he is the, the savior of the world. And he expressed the following. Come, arise, come forth unto me that ye may thrust in your hands to my side, that, that you may feel the prints of my nail of my hands and my feet, that you may know that I am the God of Israel, and I am the God of the whole earth, that I have slain myself for the sins of the world. For you and me. I want to read again for this beautiful passage. These brothers just sang 
that so beautifully Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore, be thine. Now and forevermore be thine. What a beautiful praising song we heard. May we cultivate the power of listening ears to feel his love. And may we cultivate the power of listening ears, especially the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives, so that we will come close to the Savior, so that we will know that he is truly, he died, and for you and me, and I come to know, yes, someone expressed so beautifully, listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit is the dimension of love. The listening is the art of eternal quest. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, if we cultivate that power, in our daily lives, we will come close to the Savior. I bear you my solemn witness that I know Jesus is a Christ. I know him because I know he is the Savior of the world. May we cultivate that spiritual sensitivity to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives so that we can feel his love constantly in our daily lives. And I want to express, my brothers and sisters, the learning we may not compare what suffering and agonies and a pain our Savior went through that Garden of Gethsemane, we may not compare or we may not comprehend the great suffering in our mortal comprehension. However, in our walks of daily lives, in every walks of our daily lives, we may face with our own Garden of Gethsemane. When we face it, you may lose your eternal companion, or you may lose your mom and dad, or your friend may betray you, or traitor, trade you, or maybe your friend may hate you or dislike you, or maybe you may face with a traffic accident, Oh, maybe you become deaf. Oh, maybe you become handicapped. I don't know what trials may we face in our daily lives, but may we learn that beautiful lessons from this great, great teaching of our Heavenly Father and the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, that when we face in our trials and temptations, in our own Garden of Gethsemane, we will not blame the Lord, we will not blame our God, but may we say humbly to ourselves, Thy will be done. May we also cultivate that faith to say to our Heavenly Father and to the Lord, Thy will be done. We'll not blame anybody. We'll not blame our birth, birth light or the situations we're facing in our daily lives. May we really cultivate that power to say to our Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, Thy will be done. I want to share 
the beautiful story. One of your friend. His name is Mick. He served a mission in Japan. After he returned from mission from Japan, he earned a BA bachelor degree in a political science of this great university. And he served as the president of the Kruger Club. And also, <clears throat> one year he left, only one year left of the law school. He was, he married and he had two sons. And age was two and six. Recently, I received the um, letter from his stake president. Two weeks ago, I met this Mick and his lovely wife. And I received the most powerful testimony from these two beautiful people. And I want to share this beautiful story of the Mick. And surely, surely he went, went through his own garden Gethsemane. He was active in the sports and talent and in every way when he was in the school. However, after he almost graduated from this school, Mick had the real prestigious law firm in Nebraska when he had been employed as a law clerk in a very prestigious the law firm. It was their summer office garden party was held that the tragedy was happening that summer. Paramedics and have arrived at, and this great, the fun party rushed out the door, back door, to where the party guests had been steeled. Mick was lying flat on the ground, veering in and out of the consciousness. A young man was bent over him, administering mouth to mouth and helping of this great uh, brother. And the following employees came and crowded and around an expression of the fear and concern of this mech. And the many people expressed a great concern. And then one guy said, well, just how much did this guy had to drink? And, um, and then a friend replied that um, quite defensively, Oh, he doesn't drink. He's a Mormon. He's a solid Mormon. But the homes in this well-to-do Nebraska suburb bordered around the man-made lake. When the Mick arrived at the party, there are many swimming. Farther out, he could see a boat swimming and screaming, stop. And at, at top, at the lake with the water skiers, and the training behind and then the Mick decided to go for a swim. He dove into the lake, but he hit the shallow spot, that place. And diagnosis was broken, was a broken neck. And Mick was immediately rendered paralyzed, whole body. He could not move muscles or any parts of his body from his neck down to the lost capacity, even the breath. And he required a special equipment just to feel his lung with air. His doctor said, did not expect him to survive such an injury. He told in his family that he would not luckily to make it through that night, particular night. Five years later, Mick Boyle had become much more than just make it through that night. He had overcome tremendous odds and pain, suffering, and overwhelm obstacles in his life, the emotional and the physical pain that every, every imaginable way must experience in a conceivable to most, this great, great young man. 
Yet he continued on and wasted no time for him. Determined to graduate from law school, Mick resumed studied continually from his hospital bed in the intensive care unit in the University of Utah Medical Center. Only three, uh, three weeks after in this incident, he studied hard and he really studied and he studied law eight to 10 hours each day. This is an impressive things. I just want to share another element in this story. Friends from the school of this school brought the tapes and then lectures and notes from a class every day from here to Salt Lake City. And he read from textbooks and a book, flipped, it cha flipped chart, and he simply had to wait until someone came by and was nice enough to find the proper page again. That kind of a condition he has to went through. In the spring of 1878, Mick graduated from the J. Reuben Clark Junior School in this law school here. With the members of his own class, shortly hereafter, he passed the Utah Taste Bar Examination and became a licensed practicing attorney. He went right to work at the council, the legal center for the handicap in Salt Lake City. In 18 months, he hand handled approximately almost 80 cases in that capacity. Always presented handicapped individual in need of a legal assistance. Not only that, in this turmoil and pain, his former wife decided Mick is not for the eternal companion. Took her two babies and left Mickey, Mick. That was a great, great shocking for Mick. But he never ever said and complained or anything. And he said to the Lord, the Lord thy will be done. And he insisted himself that he wants to serve the Lord. And then the last spring, the Lord answered to his prayer. His former nurse one day knocked his door, said, I want to be your eternal companion. What a beautiful story. And I asked the charity the last two weeks ago in the state conference, Shirley came up to the pulpit. She did most beautiful testimony. It was a no dry eyes in that conference. My brothers and sisters, make continued on and he said this he asked someone don't you ever get depressed oh sure someday I can get very depressed however Mick said but I know there is a lot of work to be done not only for others but I myself to work Getting well myself, especially I must prepare myself to meet with my Savior. Brothers and sisters, don't you think this is our goals? To prepare ourselves so that we will, day, we will have the day will come so that we will truly be prepare ourselves. Mick works hard at getting well, nourishes faith and positive attitude about it all the time. And he exercises every day and maintains contact with the doctors 
that have recently made now and the most astonishing improvement and breakthrough. Brothers and sisters, how much we can learn this kind of a story. Time has always been important to Mick, and immediately after this accident, a span of few, brief second meant the difference time itself, and a few months more meant the difference of obtaining in the law degree. Five years later, Mick himself has meant in a difference for many who had been victimed by the unfortunate circumstances like him. Mick had that wasted. Mick has, no, has wasted no time. And he has accomplished more than ever. Brothers and sisters, are you blind? Are you deaf? And are you paralyzed like a Mick? Are you unloved by someone or loving, unloving by someone? Or are you diseased spiritually or emotionally or physically? However, may we learn this great, great principle to have a faith in the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, because he died for you and me. And he is our master, and he is our God, and he is our anchor of our soul. May we cultivate that power to closeness to our Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we can be close to him, to say to the Lord, Lord, I humbly express myself May I serve thee and glorify thy name forevermore. My brothers and sisters, I want to express and I want to tell you our story. It was happening in Japan. After the right, the, right after the war, this young boy lost the father and lost practically everything in his life. Because of the war, this young man naturally hated Americans, prejudiced towards American. Because of his misunderstanding, after he grew up, this young boy knew what was the cause of the war. Only handful Japanese leaders took initiative to broke the war, and he later understood the true situation. However, this young boy lost the father, and, and then practically every opportunities he left with his brother and sister and a young sister. After the war, you know, there is nothing Practically nothing. Hard to eat, how to wear. Sometime his socks can see the blue sky. However, his mother always tried to help and to teach and to close. As he grew up, about the time of the graduate from a junior high school, this young boy had a privilege, the chance to go to senior high school. One day, this young boy, he heard a conversation with his brother and mother, knew that financial difficulties of this home. The following morning, though his brother said, you can go to a, junior, and a senior high school, this young man decided, my brother, I will not go. I will work and help the family. This was a decision of this young man. And then he found a little tiny shop which produced the bean curd. And we call it in Japan tofu. That was a major protein after the war, the Japanese home. 
He found a tiny little factory to work himself, to earn the little bread and butter himself. And then the night he registered to go to the part-time school, which was the senior high school. He gets up almost 4.30 every morning and uh, until the 6 o'clock. And 6 o'clock he went for the evening school for about 11. He comes home about 11.30. That was a, the life schedules of this young boy. And he went and went almost 12 months because of the uh, inadequate I mean, a sufficient, not a sufficient sleep. And this young boy found himself one day in the hospital. Doctor told his mother, his mother, he won't make it. Very critical. There is no medication for this man, for this boy. This boy sensed that that was his destiny. Without knowing God, Jesus Christ, and the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and God, without knowing how to pray, this boy prayed, O oh God, if art thou there, if art there, save my life. If thou save me, I shall repay thee someday and to serve thee. This was a simple prayer of this young boy. After the medication, and after the medication and a blessing, of course, this young boy left the hospital after two months in order to recuperate his health. This young boy was staying in uncle's home in the northern part of the Japan cold place. It was about the same time. There was a young man from Pocatello, Idaho. And then a man from also the Salt Lake City went to San Francisco and crossed the big pond, <laughs> the Pacific, and took them almost a month there was no jumbo plane those days. And then uh, they arrived in Japan after the few trainings and a laboring in that vicinity around the Tokyo. They went up to northern part of Japan in a cold place. It is not like a cold, dry cold here. It's very, very humidity is so thick and it's cold, very cold place. And then the, it was, it was a P-Day. Missionary, they call themselves P-Day, wasn't that though? <laughs> and then um, it was a P-Day. This senior companion from Pocatello, Idaho. His name is Delmont C. Law. Great man. And he, as the junior companion said, Companion, can we go knock the doors today? Knocking door today on Monday? <laughs> it was a days and weeks and months. There was no success whatsoever to these missionaries. And then finally, mutually agreed. And they, after the breakfast, they took off. And they knock and knock and knock the doors. And the evening dawned until. And then they felt that because of the cold and snow and raining start, they felt that they should go home to have hot soup. They agreed that they should go home. And then the Spirit prompted them again, especially this senior companion from Pocatello, Idaho. And then he expressed to his companion, said, Companion, can we go a few more doors? And they again agreed and then went on. 
In that same vicinity around the neighbor, this young boy just to got off the hospital and in order to recuperate in his uncle's home and waiting for something without knowing what. In a dark and cold room in that uncle's home, the missionary was knocking that same, around the same neighbor. Yes, they found this young boy. As he saw this foreigner, this young boy said to them, I don't like you Americans. Please go home. This was a first reply of this young boy. But this again, a man from Pocatello, Idaho, said to him, we have a message for you. Can't you even spend the five minutes? That was a very strong statement. And this young boy accepted. This young boy accepted the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, this young boy is now stand before you. Oh, that day I almost missed that glorious everlasting gospel that your forefathers and mothers preserved. This great legacy, great heritage, even the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching. I accepted the beauties of that day. I glanced the beauties of that panorama of this great legacy. To me, my wound, my pains, my suffering, my patches from the war and my stitches from the war was gone because of the gospel of the Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. I stand before you and bear you my solemn witness that this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that Joseph saw God and Father and Jesus Christ, and this is a glorious gospel of the Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. I pray and I seek and I pray that the glorious blessings of, you, of our Heavenly Father and a choicest blessings and a bounteous blessings to be with you. May we see and comprehend and the vision understand your legacy, the great legacy that you have of this great gospel of the Lord Savior Jesus Christ. And you too may touch the lives of another people. I leave you my solemn witness that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of living God. I love my Heavenly Father. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this church. I love you, beautiful people, you folks.
I leave you my solemn witness that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of living God. This is the gospel of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Without him, we are meaningless. In him, and by him, and through him, and by the grace of his pure love, once again, may we return to our Heavenly Father's presence. And I know that burning desire of your heart within your bosom, you have that beautiful sparkle and a legacy that you have that you inherited from your forefathers and mothers. May thy light shine forth to the world after you graduate from this great institution, even the Brigham Young University, and go to the world to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, and surely we must be the savor of the salt. And I know that is our destiny, to glorify the Lord's name and to testify his holy mission of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we can be, this truly be the light of the world and to be the savor of the salt. I love you. And because you love the Lord, I love you because you love the Lord and God. And I leave you my testimony and my love to you tonight. I'm grateful for this opportunity to stand before you. I prepared my talk in a script, but I decided not to use tonight, only mix part. May you feel the spirit of Christ and may you feel the spirit of our Heavenly Father and even the Holy Ghost that you will go. Go and serve for the Master of our center of our faith. I thank my wife she is my companion and she is my friend and she is my eternal mate and she is my eternal counselor and a friend. Please, you young husband, sometime go out without the children by Big Mac. Take time to be thoughtful, take time to be kind, and take time to go to the temple together. Take time to holding hands and pray, and take time to climb the mountain sometime, after snow melt, of course, <laughs> and to sit upon the rock and express to yourself to your eternal mate and sit. I love you with all my heart. And go to the Utah Lake, but be careful this year, we have lots of water there. <laughs> but after the summer, maybe it's during the summer, walk the seashore of that beautiful lake and express to yourself that I love you and I love you with all my heart. My brethren and sisters, take time to be kind and take time to be thoughtful. Those of you still looking for it to know, mate, don't rush, but hurry. <laughs> but 
Spirit will guide you and a fine eternal beauty, beautiful companion. I leave you my solemn witness and I leave you my testimony that this is a work of the Lord and Jesus is a Christ. Joseph was a prophet and the Spencer is the prophet of the Lord. He said one time, with all my love, I have and I possessed. I love the saints and I bless the saints. May we listen to his great counsel. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.